Um, so this is the, the time that we've reserved for group discussion. And so um, there are a number of students who have volunteered to help facilitate your discussions at your table. If you guys want to strategically place yourselves so that you are at tables that are not filled with only students. And, um, and we'd just like to spend perhaps 15 minutes um, for table discussions about some of the, the most interesting solutions that you've heard, uh, some ideas for solutions or moving forward that have occurred to you throughout the day. And we're going to um, have, and that's gonna sort of provide the, the ferment for our final panel uh, discussion that we'll, uh, we'll reconvene at about three o'clock for. So the question that we're faced with in the final hour of our time here together is where do we go from here? And I'd like to ask Councillor Raymond Louis and MP Kennedy Stewart to please come up and take a seat. And I'm going to I'm, I'm just going to introduce our panelists, but then I'm, I'm going to ask both of our panelists to, to listen, first of all. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm just going to let, let us know um, who we're presenting to, and then I'm going to ask a few of the table representatives to, to present back what you've been talking about. And then I know that both Kennedy and Raymond were at a, a different table, so they'll be able to to reflect on the discussions that they've had as they make their, their remarks as well and help us to make some sense out of all of the great ideas and, and big problems that we've heard throughout the day. So I'll start on my uh, immediate left. Councillor Raymond Louis is in a, a perfect position to talk about the, the challenges and opportunities within this nexus of governance uh, challenges because he is both a longtime councillor for the City of Vancouver as well as the Vice Chair of the Metro Vancouver Board and the President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So he serves um, in almost every governance capacity that one could in, in, in his, in his um, stature. Um, and Kennedy Stewart, um, sitting beside Councillor Louis, um, is the uh, Member of Parliament for Burnaby South. He was elected in 2011 and again in 2015. And he also serves as the BC Caucus Chair. And he's also uh, my colleague at Simon Fraser University in the School of Public Policy. Um, so comes with a, with a strong uh, pol political solutions seeking and, and critical background as well as um, con some considerable time in the trenches of trying to work through um, local, regional, and federal political dynamics moving forward. So can I ask Angela? What, where is Angela? Well, yeah, so can you, do you wanna um, come and tell us what you were talking about in terms of solutions at your table? At the microphones right here, maybe. Hi. Um, so my table was great, and we talked a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of the existing regional um, governance model. And so to start with some of the challenges we found is that we felt that it wasn't so much a problem with the model, but more of an issue around the people and the relationships, especially around um, the region, the provinces, the province and the municipalities coming together and sort of working together. And so that's something that the table really discussed as a way, as, as an issue that perhaps needed to be focused on more, especially coming into the future. As, uh, there was a overwhelming focus on transit and transportation, um, which is an interesting thing that we discussed as well because there's so many other elements to the regional uh, governance model related to water and sewage and everything else, so it's interesting that we focus heavily on transit and transportation, and we feel like that's because the public is so heavily um, impacted on a daily basis by ch uh, challenges within that system, and so that's something uh, that the table really discussed heavily. And finally, there was sort of um, some contention around reconciling um, 
urban and rural growth, as well as addressing the sprawl that is happening at the same time and sort of f finding a balance between the two is something that we don't feel, or that the table didn't feel that um, the model currently takes in, in, into account. However, we did feel that there's not enough public discussion around the successes of the governance model, especially around sewage and water and the fact that it's almost as if when things are not discussed, you know they're sort of going well. And so that's something that could be, maybe more, more attention could be drawn to the model um, around sewage and water. As well, um, there was just a brief mention that um, there is a sort of improvements around safety and security that, that, that is commendable and that is something that um, is looked upon quite fondly, but um, there seems to, again, be contention around whether or not it's a cultural harmony or an issue of integration and isolation that's driving sort of public, public sentiments around regional growth and maybe that's something that could be discussed more publicly um, with the governance model, but with public consultation and better engagement. Okay, thank you. There, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna hog the conversation. Thank you, and um, Helena, did you wanna try and provide a summary for your table's discussion? Okay, so I'll add a bit. Um, I think we talked about some similar things at my table. Um, People felt that a strength of the system is kind of dealing with utilities at a regional level, um, as well as transportation on a regional level. Um, but thank you. Um, but um, we did talk about how, as was said earlier today, um, a lot of issues, uh, some issues are black and white, local or regional, but a lot of them fall somewhere in the middle in that gray area, and so that obviously causes problems, particularly. Um, if people are, if, munis if municipalities disagree around what they want or even have conflicting goals at a regional level, then obviously that creates some problems within the model. Um, we talked a little bit about um, kind of in terms of changes that we might want. We talked a bit about maybe having um, directly elected members at the regional level. Um, and there was some talk about the idea that these people should perhaps be the same people that are elected locally. So they would be city councillors or mayors that would then go on to represent uh, Metro Vancouver as one idea. Um, we also talked about how um, there needs to be more clear definitions as to which areas are local, which are regional, and kind of get some clarity around that. Um, but we also talked about how there's very few absolutes in this area, so there's usually, for a lot of issues, you need some sort of combination of local and regional um, working together on that. So those are some of the things we talked about. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna ask the other groups to, to hold on to their discussions and uh, we'll have a chance to, um, to take up a lot of these issues after, but uh, first I'd like to hear from Councillor Louie. Would you like to provide your thoughts on where we can go from here? On my table or you. Let's You, let's go with you and then we can, we can reflect on your table discussion too. There? Sure. Well, let me start by saying I'm also the chair of the Pacific National Exhibition. So if that's my fun, uh, fun component of my job, if you'd like to go to the PE, hope you do. Um, uh, I came here today with a bit of notes, uh, similar to uh, both what Jonathan and Jack had done. And uh, Jonathan did such a good job of outlining some of our successes at, at Metro Vancouver. I won't uh, go into the details, uh, but uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of who we are and what we are. Uh, as I said, as was introduced, I wear a number of different hats as a City of Vancouver elected and Metro Vancouver Vice Chair. And uh, it's a little more complicated, Jonathan, what Greg and I go through in order to give you that appointment. <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's, it was, we, I think we made the right choice for sure. Um, uh, I would say that at a national level, this is not something that is new, that uh, we struggle uh, nationally at the local government level on how to be effective, uh, more effective, because it comes down to us working together, uh, because there's oftentimes local governments that uh, uh, don't have the resources or they um, don't have the expertise. Um, similar challenges, you'd be surprised. I've traveled uh, to every province across the country and uh, almost every territory now and it's almost about the same uh, across our country. And so when we have uh, issues to deal with uh, at a regional level, I can say that uh, we're, we're in good company or you know, we're in tough company sometimes. What I would say though is that we have it pretty good here in, in Metro Vancouver. Our quality of life is high, our services are delivered and delivered uh, efficiently. We have plans, uh, they're, they're mostly adhered to. We have some uh, issues with uh, uh, some of the implementation. Um, and I, I think uh, 
although I wasn't here earlier, uh, what I seem to have gathered is that it comes as a result of the leadership that had come before and the plans and the efforts of people to put in place, I think, a construct that has helped us to where we are today. Wish I would have been here for some of the discussion with Harold and uh, uh, Minister Fassbender. I understand that was quite interesting. Um, but I, I'm going to get a full accounting from Harold a little bit later, maybe from Minister Fassbender as well. Um, so the result, of course, is uh, the region that we have. Uh, we also know that it's under threat, that we have some challenges that are facing us. You know, we have growth pressures, lack of resources, inefficient allocation of those resources sometimes, misalignment of policy decisions, aging infrastructure, aging population. Uh, so today when I was asked to uh, uh, speak and say, you know, what I think we can do or where, sh where sh can we go from here, I know it's, it, it's a little bit different depending on which hat I'm wearing. But I think, you know, the underlying piece for all of it is that we need to be bold, that we need to take action. Uh, we've been talking about it for a very long time. And so it's, uh, it's not as complicated as uh, you might think. I think that uh, we have some examples here in Metro Vancouver where we've taken action on zero waste, the National Zero Waste Council, and it's national because we knew that we can't just do it at, at a local government level or a regional level, but we need to influence the country, in fact, uh, not just at an at a elected level, but across the country in terms of uh, the, the producers of, of um, the, uh, the garbage and the recyclables and uh, the regulators at, at, at a federal level and provincial level as well. So uh, that's just one example, but there's often, uh, as, a, as a region and a country, we have uh, tremendous resources, and at least uh, our system is very uh, stable as a, as a government. Our employment is low, our food security is mostly not an issue. Uh, even housing, although it's a continuing challenge, we have some glimmers of hope from the, uh, from the, uh, the federal government level with their comments of creating a national housing strategy. Um, but Again, to put it in context, we look around the world and uh, some of those other jurisdictions that I've traveled to and uh, had some uh, opportunity to interact with at international conferences is that they don't have resources. They don't even have clean water or they're struggling for one well. Uh, they are uh, struggling for food. They don't have uh, housing. And so we've got a tremendous opportunity is what I'm saying. And so when I say the answer is to be bold, it's about using the resources that we have available to us. Now, how do we get to a place where we can be bold and use the resources that we have? We, well, we need alignment. We need alignments uh, between, first and foremost, the, at the local government level for us to agree. And how do we get agreement? Well, hopefully what happens is we get it from the people. Our people tell us, you know, so that comes down to a little bit about a comment earlier about engagement, making sure that our, our residents understand what we're trying to accomplish, that they support us. They give us the longevity of political life to advance the things that are important to them and that they stick with us so that we can implement. Now, I'll give you an example. In Vancouver, we've been elected as a majority for three terms. I've been on council for five terms, both in opposition and in government. One of our main platforms at the beginning, and we spoke a little bit, I heard comments about platforms. We put it into our platform that we were to become the greenest city in the world. And we were bold about that. And we put our political life on the line three times in order to make that happen. And we detailed how we were going to go about doing that. But we also knew that it wasn't just about us at, at, in Vancouver, it was about the region. And we enlist people uh, around the region and we work with people around the regions at elected and federally and you know, at, at nationally, and uh, finally we, we worked very hard to make sure that the federal parties understood what we were trying to accomplish as well. We were rewarded at this last election. You know, we, when, we, the, when the federal government puts uh, $50 million to the FCM uh, for, um, for asset management, $75 million for climate adaptation, another $125 million for the Green Municipal Fund, that's, those are positive steps. And I spoke earlier about the um, the issue of, of housing and them committing to a national housing strategy. Well, that's a commitment at least. There's more work to be done. When they changed the funding uh, strategy uh, for local government or, and their funding for transit, water, and wastewater to 50% of funding at a federal level, that's a positive step, especially in light of the fact that we receive only eight to 10 cents of every tax dollar. So when we have these opportunities and we have alignment with a government, we need to take the chance and move and invest and match that, that opportunity. 
My hope is that uh, we have that same type of commitments coming out of our provincial government. Uh, we have an opportunity to leverage that federal monies. If they don't, well, then it, then it comes back down to us uh, as local government, as individuals, as residents of, of this region to speak out and be active and to make sure that we get the alignment that we need. Because it doesn't come very often where you have a local government, uh, 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 order of government, your provincial and our federal, all working in the same direction. And if we can do that, then I think that change uh, will happen. Change is coming regardless. Um, people will come. They will bring their resources. They will bring their experiences. And we need to look at it not as a challenge, but an opportunity. You know, there's uh, some cities that are having out-migration of people. There are cities that and municipalities that don't have resources. We are not that. People are coming, we have the resources, we have bright people like you in the, in, the, in the room today, and we just need to make sure that we influence every component along the way so that we can go down that path to, uh, what was the, uh, so that we continue to have cities in a sea of green. So those are my comments, thank you. Okay, uh, first I'd really like to thank the organizers for putting this together, uh, to bring all the thought leaders in the region together in one room to spend a whole day thinking about a region. And I think uh, Meg and crew and Josh should, uh, we should give them a round of applause for all the work they've done here. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, so I love coming back to SFU. Uh, I love uh, the discussion here uh, much more than I like my time in the House of Commons where the, it's a very less productive uh, kind of dialogue. But I certainly don't miss the marking, so I think it's a, it's a good balance. Uh, earlier uh, panels have explored the challenges uh, facing Metro Vancouver and, uh, and uh, past governance solutions. So uh, I wasn't here for the whole day, but I've been caught up in what's uh, been happening and the discussions that have gone on, and I think they're very positive and, and lots for us to think about. So I've been asked to offer uh, a few thoughts about the future of the region. And over the next few minutes, and I was told I have seven, I will outline uh, how we should... I could have eight minutes. Okay. Eight to ten. Yeah, there's one there. Somewhere. Okay. I'll outline how we should change our regional government system and why. So in my mind, there's no doubt uh, that Vanco Metro Vancouver needs a directly elected mayor. We need a champion to coordinate and tackle pressing regional problems and a living symbol to promote Metro Vancouver around the globe. Metro Vancouver is already one of the best places to live in the world, uh, but many of our neighbors struggle to make, uh, make ends meet, and there are real problems that need to be addressed. If we don't address these problems, if they're allowed to get worse, we could widen the gap between rich and poor and make our region much less livable. The problems we face and the opportunities we're missing are numerous, and we need a new governance structure to move toward, uh, forward on issues such as transportation, <laughs> crime, housing, and the economy. And I know we've discussed all that here today, but I'm just going to run over them again, my thoughts on that quickly. We've heard how the regional problems in the past prompted action from the provincial government. First, when the province enacted the Regional Planning Board in 1949, and later when it created regional districts in 1965. And these boards, as we know, are essentially round tables where local mayors and councillors gather to dialogue about the region's needs and to set out planning uh, detailed plans after consulting with the public. However, these plans are usually frustrated by federal and provincial government decisions. They're not in alignment, as Raymond said. So let's take transportation. We only have to look at the transit map to see how the priorities of senior governments are often at odds with the real needs of the region. The Canada Line, for example, was not a priority for local mayors and councils, but yet it was put in place. Or our recent transit plebiscite joke, which clearly showed the provincial government's lack of commitment to locally generated transit priorities. Inefficient transportation undermines economic productivity, health, wealth, and the environment. And we need a directly elected mayor to defend regional transport planning priorities against senior government whims. So how about crime? Let's talk about one of the most horrific events in our region's history, and we like to forget this, but we had the Pork Coquitlam pig farm murders. We had a criminal or criminals picking up victims in one municipality and committing heinous crimes in another. The lack of regional coordination of policing services was one reason why it took so long to identify, properly investigate, and ultimately stop what is a mass murder. 
The same holds for gang activity, where criminal, uh, criminals living in one city drive across municipal borders for shoot-ups, then they drive back to their home municipality to avoid the consequences. We need a directly elected mayor to combat regional crime and protect us from sophisticated criminals. Then we move to housing. Local mayors and councillors have really done their bit, and I think they've, they've stretched a long way on this, but the federal and provincial governments have utterly failed to act on all aspects of this issue, whether it's lack of social housing for the homeless or cooperative or affordable housing rental units for working families. We don't even have proper statistics to tell us why our market is spiraling out of control. So we need a directly elected mayor to be a housing champion for the region and to push the federal and provincial governments into action. So this isn't some kind of wacky idea of a deranged, uh, out of touch lefty politician. There are plenty of examples from which we can borrow from right here in Canada and around the world. We essentially have two choices. We have a choice of a two-tier system and we have a choice of a megacity. If you're going to have a directly elected mayor, you have to pick one of those two systems. So Montreal and London provide examples of two-tier regional government systems. In Montreal, Mayor Denis Coderre oversees regional planning and policies, while borough mayors and councils deliver local services. The same happens in London, where Mayor Boris Johnson looks after coordinating transit, housing and policing in the UK capital, and borough mayors and councils are in charge of the day-to-day -day services for 7.5 million citizens. Calgary and New York provide examples of megacities. In Calgary, Mayor Nenshi and 14 councillors plan and directly deliver services for 1.2 million Calgarians. The same holds true in New York, where Mayor, uh, Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio follows on a long line of famous mayors, including Bloomberg and Giuliani, that work with a 51-member council to plan and deliver, directly deliver services for 8.5 million people. So in Metro Vancouver, we could have a two-tier system where the province decentralizes decentralizes planning and coordination powers to, say, Metro Mayor uh, Carol Taylor, who then works with a local mayors Robertson, Corrigan, and Hepner to plan and deliver services. Or we could have a megacity where Mayor Joy McPhail or Mayor Raymond Louie plans and directly delivers services for our 2.5 million residents. So uh, I want to finish my thoughts about talking about the economy and why a directly elected mayor is important for building our economy in a globalized world. When international business is looking to invest in our region, it is important they have a single point of contact. When businesses come to Metro Vancouver now, they think they have to speak to Mayor Robertson. After all, he is the mayor of Vancouver. But these, quick, these businesses, and they've told me, they quickly find out that Mayor Robertson can't help them set up shop once they want to move out of the downtown. Once they want to move in the surrounding suburbs, they have to deal with a whole bunch of different uh, elected officials. And then they find that the Premier's powers can only go so far. So business has no such problem in Calgary, Montreal, London, or New York. The businesses can go, go to the mayor and get answers directly and also get startup assistance. And this is the same when we go to other countries on trade missions. Mayor Coderre and Enchi can pitch for their whole region where our mayors cannot, even when they sit as the rotating GVRD board chair. So we need a directly elected mayor to champion our regional economy, to go and attract new investment, to help those businesses uh, when we want uh, to get started, and to tell those businesses that we don't want, such as Kinder Morgan and its bitumen pipeline, that their business is not welcome. So as we've heard throughout the day, the problems we face are not caused by irresponsible local mayors and councils. They do a fantastic job. For example, McLean's Magazine calls Burnaby the best administered city in the country. Our regional challenges are caused by the provincial government failing to devolve authority needed to properly run our region. To move ahead in this global economy, the, provinces need, the province needs to step up and devolve authority to a newly direct elected mayor with the heft to help us compete with powerhouse cities around the world. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks very much. So those are uh, strikingly different and compelling presentations. I, I'm reminded of, I think it was David Bragdon earlier today that said, good, deft, deft people, socially deft people, politically deft people can make a bad system work, um, but a, in a good system, you still need good people, right? So perhaps that would be a good way of comparing the two visions that have just been presented. Um, I'd invite your questions or your comments based on your discussion.
don't know why I walked to this one and not to that one. <laughs> Maybe you should tilt it because you're okay. Too, too tall. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised you point to Montreal because uh, Denis Coderre is the mayor of the city of Montreal, which covers about 80% of the population of the island alone and only about half the population of the metropolitan area. What the, the way that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Montreal metropolitan community and the, uh, the, uh, the transit body work is pretty much like the regional district model with uh, local officials uh, sitting on these regional bodies uh, and making decisions. So, I mean, Denis Coderre is no different than John Tory pitching for, uh, for the Toronto region, um, as he's increasingly doing. So, I, I almost see that as a ratification of the model that you already have here. I mean, do, do you, do, so would you recommend that there be a council that uh, would be elected from wards that would cross-cut municipal boundaries across the region? And if so, would you expect there to be uh, perhaps new fronts of conflict opening up between the two levels because you have competing electoral legitimacies. Who takes that or do we go, go ahead. Yeah, okay, sure. great. Well, thanks very much for the questions. Um, what I think we have done right here is we have about 100% of our region under, under the GVRD or Metro Vancouver, so that's a good first start. It's just figuring out how we run all that. So as you're, you're right, uh, in Calgary it's almost 100%, so that's why I pointed to Nenshi, but you're right, Montreal is a little outside. So, um, But he is, an, he is an example of a mayor who's getting things done. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's not a perfect metaphor, but it's, you know, to serve an example. In terms of the city, uh, I think this is something, you know, what we do here in, in Metro Vancouver, I think that uh, we have to explore it. If we have in mind, and this is, when I lived in London in uh, 97, uh, Tony Blair was faced with these same problems. He said he was gonna bring in a, an elected mayor for London, and then he consulted. He had to get the business community on board. He had even brought the conservatives on board eventually. So I think it was through longer discussions which you thought you had to have a consensus before you do the work, uh, before they decided on their exact structure. But in the, at the very first um, thing he did coming in as, as Prime Minister saying we need a directly elected mayor for London because frankly th the regional problems were so bad that what they were doing, they even had a specific minister for London. And so that's one step more than we have and uh, that, didn't, uh, that wasn't doing it either. So I would argue that Livingston and uh, Boris Johnson have made a huge difference in that city and it's the structure, one of the models of the structure I've proposed for here. Thanks. Um. Well, let me let me say that uh, across Canada, there's a number of different models that are in place. There are some regionally uh, elected, directly elected boards already, and uh, they seem to function fine. Um, what I would say, though, is that I, I think, and it's perhaps a bias, uh, given that I'm vice chair of Metro Vancouver, is that I think we have one of the most functional and well-run uh, regional districts, and we are um, looked to as one of the best, not just in Canada, but around the world as well. Now, to the issue of, um, that uh, candidates uh, had spoken about, as a result of having a directly elected, you could then have a person advocate. I can tell you that Greg Moore, as the chair of Metro Vancouver, does exactly that. And oftentimes, Greg and I travel to Victoria and elsewhere to go and do that type of advocacy, and um, we're somewhat successful, depending on who. Who's, uh, who's listening. But it's not dissimilar to my role as FCM president, where I go and speak to our federal electeds, including uh, my yeah. friend. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah. And um, I'm not directly elected into my FCM president, but it's my peers from all the 2,000 plus municipalities across Canada that elected me into that position to advocate. So it's similar to what we have at the regional level. The last thing I would say is that Depending on the model, if it is a ward system, then you're beholden to that ward to represent that ward. When we sit as a Metro Vancouver Board of Director, theoretically, we take off our, I take off my Vancouver hat. I sit, uh, and more so as Vice Chair, I sit as a Regional Director. I, my intention is to uh, better the, the standing of the region as a whole and setting aside what's happening in Vancouver, and, and sometimes to the detriment of Vancouver. And I, can, I have a number of examples that we, I think we've stepped up as, as a city uh, for the betterment of, of the region as itself. And so it's not always that this direct election gives you the best result. Hmm. Wes. Uh, Kennedy, I'm <clears throat> I applaud you for just sort of laying it out there and, and coming up with a pretty bold uh, 
bold assertion like that, but I want to just clarity, are you suggesting that we go through like a full amalgamation like Toronto or Montreal has gone through in order to do that or simply have a position like an elected mayor who can advocate and mobilize resources like that? And, and secondly, as a, as a follow-up to get Councillor uh, Louis' opinion here, we had an interesting discussion about the legitimacy of, of Metro Vancouver and uh, I think getting a little bit at what Kennedy is getting at about what more can it do and how it can be more uh, legitimate in the eyes of the electorate. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, Mayor Cote brought up um, uh, economic development and how we have competition between Surrey and Vancouver and everyone else and housing and how we have an underutilized housing authority of sorts with Metro Vancouver. And I'm wondering how you see Metro becoming more relevant as a level of government and if it has to go down that path that, that uh, Kennedy's talking about in order to have the, the legitimacy to take on an expanded role. Okay, uh, so what's the model? So again, start with directly elected mayor and then uh, consult to see where you get to. So we, we hear lots about what happened in Toronto with the mega city mergers there, which actually wasn't the mega city merger, it was just a small part of, of, the, of the greater Toronto area. Um, but I actually wrote and, and published on this looking at polling before and after. Uh, and there was all kinds of um, hubbub about, you know, this is the end of the world kind of thing. But actually in the end, citizens were, were happy with the merger. Uh, they, they thought there was, they were getting a little less local service, but they were happy that there was kind of one voice for the region. Uh, I'm not advocating that's the way to go, but I do think you should, you should keep your mind open as you're going into these, these kind of discussions with the full idea. I mean, I'd like to see it as an election issue here provincially, is that we start talking about this region rather than other, you know, because it's probably the most important, it's our most important economic engine for the province, and yet it gets ignored. Uh, we spend all our time talking about pipelines and not about how to make this region work better. So, so for me, I I think all models should be open and uh, I guess that's maybe my academic side of me is like let's let's put everything on the table and try to limit it as we go along. Um, just on the on the issues of expanding the the breadth of what we accomplish at Metro Vancouver and where we um, where where we have I think jurisdiction is the uh, what's given to us from the provincial government and, and our utilities and we've stretched it a bit. Uh, regional prosperity is an example where under the general government component, we've moved away from just economic development because the fra that framing, I think, is, is limited. It's not just economic development. It's pro the prosperity of the region as a whole, and that encompasses uh, so much more in terms of quality of life of individuals and, and, and our residents and our businesses and our competitiveness um, as a region when compared to others. Uh, and uh, that's why we're moving in that, using those, that specific, uh, that phrase. Um, on housing, uh, we are contemplating uh, uh, how we go about doing it better. That this arcane uh, and surprising uh, construct of uh, Metro Vancouver Housing uh, Corporation and the, uh, and the committee structure that we've uh, uh, introduced to, to uh, give advice to it, which is the same people, is a bit odd. Uh, so we're going to look at that. Uh, to, to see what can be done. Um, we, as a region, I think, need to step in where there's limited resources at a local government level. V City of Vancouver, we've stepped fully into the fray on housing and because we know it, it absolutely needs to be addressed and we are um, not unafraid. Uh, as I said, we are bold in, in doing that in the hopes that we can attract other, other funders into the equation, governmental or otherwise. But there's instances where the region can help, and, and I, I look at our regional parks function as an example where uh, there was a time where there was very little resources in, our, in some of our member municipalities to purchase land and preserve that for the future, and that's where at a regional level, we were able to pool our resources, make that forward investment so that we can preserve the, that quality of life I spoke of for future generations, and those are the types of things that I'm interested in at, at a regional level. I, I do want the, uh, the provincial government to, to give us more authorities, uh, but uh, we'll see. I, get, I, will, I will just jump in there because I think, Councillor Louie, you, you might not have been here yet when um, Richard Hankin was making, was, was sort of thinking back to the creation of uh, GVRD parks and the regional park system. And one of the messages that he delivered quite loud and clear, at least to me, was that if they had waited even five more years before making some of those key land acquisitions and protecting them as regional parks, uh, that they would have lost that, that they would have lost that entire opportunity. So I guess what I'm wondering is, 
you know, is housing, are, are, is, is prosperity or regional economic development, are there, are there looming agendas that aren't considered to be central yet to our regional agenda that we're missing that opportunity on right now? Well, there, there, there likely are. It really does come down to the separation of duties and who you want to spend your tax dollars. Who do you trust? You know, when election time rolls around, you'll peer, prob probably hear just about the same. We care about clean, wear, clean air, clean water. We want to make sure that you get from point A to point B in an efficient fashion and making sure that you have a roof over yourself and uh, for, your, for your children or your, uh, those that you love. Uh, it's the implementation that counts. And so how do you go about electing people that, uh, without, that don't have a record of both voting and action? Uh, how, do you, how do you test that at election time? And that's really the, the, the question. And part of that is ensuring that we elect as best we can those people that are espousing those things that you care about, but also voting for, perhaps not voting for them again, if that's not. But I, I, I would encourage you, when, if it happens to be me, that you take it in context, because there is, of course, uh, only so much resources, right? There's, there's balances that need to be, to, uh, to be found in order to accomplish things. If you watch transit and it's really expensive, you know, it might come at expense of not doing all the housing at the same time, right? It's, you can't have, have it all, and I think, but I, I think the, the, that's this premise that of a balanced budget, I, I, uh, I'm pleased to hear our Federal, federal Minister Morneau talk about 23, $29.3 billion as, a, as an investment, and uh, specifically 11.9 coming to uh, as, as part of infrastructure and direly needed at the local government level as an investment. And we needed that uh, to happen, otherwise our quality of life would have gone down, our competitiveness as a, as a country would have gone down because our infrastructure is crumbling. Mm -hmm. So my name is George Benson, I'm a planning student at UBC, um, and I think I'd be remiss as a planning student by not raising the question of who's not here present in the room. Um, and certainly seeing that both of you sit at this table, um, it's very striking that we have a municipal politician and a federal politician, and the province is not here um, for this conversation about, well, what is the future of the region? And obviously we've heard from Minister Fassbender already uh, to a certain degree um, about what that future might look like. Um, we can you know, quibble over whether or not we like that vision or not, but I'm curious, um, given the powers that you both have in your orders of government, um, what are the big picture changes maybe um, that you would like to see that are within your purview um, that, uh, that we can think about? Um, you know, we've talked about already the gas tax, the federal government's shifting some things around there, um, but can we think bigger than that at a federal level? Um, and um, Councillor Louis, I'm curious if you can speak to, you know, the wish list of municipal things that, um, of powers that you've, you've touched on a little bit, I think, but, um, you know, if we're thinking big, if this is the new future of the region, we're really trying to push things in a new direction, is it full direct taxation power for municipalities? Is it kicking around the Constitution a little bit, changing how we think about our orders of government? <coughs> what are the really big ideas we can think about beyond just in our region? How do we think about this uh, in a different way as a federation? So I'd be interested in both your answers there. Thank you. Well, um, you have more money. I have more money. Yeah, <laughs> not in the third party. We don't. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, at the federal level, I mean, we've 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 had a change of government. So the last government wasn't really interested. The Harper government wasn't interested in cities at all. I mean, their their priority was uh, reducing spending, essentially, and and big service cuts. That was they wanted to get to a balanced budget. Uh, and depending on who you believe, they did or they didn't, uh, but they lost the election, whatever, regardless. So uh, we have a new government now, we're all trying to figure out how that works uh, and what they're committed to. Um, but my thought is that, uh, you know, we do talk about some money that's coming to housing, for example, uh, lots of one-off infrastructure costs, uh, investments, which are well needed. But I, I'm struck by, for example, the amount of government invest in, in, in investment in uh, kind of social and affordable housing in other countries, where we have many countries where you have 40% of their entire housing stock is owned in one way or another by, by the government, where in Canada it's 5%. So, I've done, before I was elected, I did a lot of kind of international housing work. And really, the, in the end, there has to be massive investment in housing in order to make the market affordable for middle and low income people. And we just kind of forget that. So whatever money is put in now, I think is uh, a kind of a one-off 
assuage the voters for now, but not a serious commitment to a national housing strategy. Uh, it's a good start, but it's, I mean, you hear that all the time, don't you? But there's no, there, there's no plan to say, how do we keep people in this region? Uh, when I talk to local companies, um, you know, they say, well, we don't really like the NDP because you're a bunch of socialists, but my, uh, my employees can't live here anymore, so my company has to leave. <laughs> They can't attract international talent because the housing prices are so high. And, and so business is starting to realize, as they do in other countries, uh, that you have to have a level of, of investment in housing and transit in order to keep your region competitive. And, uh, and I just think, I'm hoping that Mr. Trudeau gets there, but I guess it's my job to push him as much as I can. So that's what I'll be doing. Okay. Good luck with you. Yeah, thank, with you. That. thank you. Um, <laughs> your question is re regarding um, direct taxation and the ability to raise funds. I think there's a parallel question to that, though, is that would I like to be downloaded uh, additional responsibilities? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but the answer to both questions uh, might be surprising. Is the answer to that is yes, in some instances. I do think that local government, being the uh, order of government closest to the people, are oftentimes in the best place to deliver some of those services. And uh, I don't mind being downloaded some of the responsibility to make them, to tailor the response to the need uh, as a result of having the best input, which is right around me. And so in order to do that, though, I do need the additional resources. Uh, it's not a new model. It happens uh, many, many jurisdictions all around the world where local government has much more ability to raise funds and to expend them in a way that meets the needs of their citizens. So it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, foreign. Uh, we have submitted, uh, uh, made a submission to the provincial government asking that as part of their contemplating how they work with us at the local government level. This is done through UBCM, Union, uh, British Columbia Municipalities. Um, they've so far rejected it. Hi, um, I'm just curious. I'm originally from Ontario, so this whole uh, regional governance thing is kind of interesting to me. Um, but also, Vancouver is in a unique position where they actually uh, vote for parties for their municipal politics where that's another thing from Ontario I'm not used to. So I'm just curious as to uh, either staying the same or changing it, how does, um, how does that inner politics within a, a city, let alone 23 municipalities, have an impact on the future making decisions? Because, um, for example, luckily there's a lot of long-standing um, agreements that can't get changed with a change of government at the local level. But if there was hypothetically able to do that and your opposition decided to um, change their mind on certain agreements or go a different route and then throws everyone for a loop, uh, I would assume, you know, that's a, you know, issue with the system. But moving forward, what impacts would that also have if we changed it to a, um, to a, uh, a regional mayoral system as well? Thank you. Um, let me say that. Uh, the difference between Ontario and British Columbia is that we are fully at large, meaning it's the first past the post system. Uh, there's a number of positions on council, the top five, top seven, top nine, you know, or, or whatever number, sorry, uh, with, including the mayor, um, gets elected. And in Ontario, you have over a certain population, you have a, a ward system. And so uh, the party system comes as a result of a necessity, especially in the city of Vancouver, where we have 600,000 uh, plus people living in our city, and we need to coordinate uh, some type of campaign that uh, can reach to, uh, have enough reach to uh, per permeate throughout the entire city, give our message of what it is that we're trying to do, and give some clarity of who it is that uh, they're voting for and what they're voting for, what they intend to do after, after the election itself. I'd be happy to, to move uh, away from the at-large system and uh, you know, move more to a locally accountable ward type system, uh, but uh, that referendum was had in Vancouver in 2004. It was turned down by the residents in city of, of Vancouver, and uh, so we're, we're where we're at. Um, I, and, you know, having a system where you have parties and the clarity of a platform isn't necessarily a bad thing. It gives you some confidence that you're, when you are having, a, you're, you're very busy in your lives where you're trying to put food on the table, roof over your head, and you've got uh, you know, perhaps family to take care of, uh, that you don't have to research so many people. That it gives you some chance to, to look at, well, what are these people wanting to do if they get elected? And, and you can hold this account based on that platform as well. Well, 
It, it does. Uh, the question was, does it create partisanship? I, I think it does to, to a degree. Um, I, I would say that 95% of the time, maybe even higher, the votes are unanimous in council, you know, especially when we're talking about roads and sewers and such. You know, budget time, usually a little, there's one council that usually votes against the budget because it's just too high, right? And, and uh, there's other things. I, I won't name who it is. You can figure it out. <laughs> Those that, that, that are, that, no Vancouver politics, but there's, uh, you know, I, I'd say that majority of the time it, it does work. Um, I think it's trending in the wrong direction though, you know, and, and uh, when I talk, spoke about at the regional level where I take off my, um, my, um, my Vancouver hat, it's less political. It's based on the issues. When I go to the national level, I don't know who's who, like whether or not they're NDP or, or liberal or conservative, because we're talking about the same issues about making sure that there's enough resources to get something done. And so it becomes less political the, the further removed you are. You know, and that's why I was at saying that once you have that uh, ward system where you have to get reelected uh, under that system, or well, even at a city level, you then lose that perspective and that luxury, I think, of thinking uh, longer term, thinking about uh, wider geographically. Um, so in a, in, a, in a system with a regional mayor and council, uh, what they've done in a lot of cities is bring in proportional representation so that you need, to, you need political parties to make that operate, but actually you get more balance on council, you usually don't get a, you usually don't get an absolute majority, so there's more, uh, you know, I think that's what all political systems should be anyway in terms of voting systems, but, uh, you know, I've seen it work in other cities where that's been, been very positive, and I think, so if you're going to go all the way, you know, I think I've been talking about ward systems since I don't know when in, in Vancouver, and uh, see Gordon Price over there, we've had our <laughs> back and forth about whether to do it or whether or not, but I think, in fact, we probably moved beyond that now, and we're really on to proportional representation, realizing that at large and wards uh, all have their limitations, so PR is probably where we go. And then in a region-wide system, you'd really need parties. If you had two and a half million people, um, you can't really run independents uh, because you can't really raise enough money to, to campaign citywide, say. So, so parties are a necessary part of that. I think parties are the best and worst part of the democracy. Like, I, I really think being in one that, you know, I'm not always on on board with, you know, my colleagues. It makes it tough inside, uh, inside the party sometimes. But uh, but in the end, they do organize, as Raymond said, they do organize uh, platforms for voters. So you can imagine voting nationally when you didn't have any idea who who uh, what who was in what party. Uh, it does allow, and they found in the past, that allows a lot of freelancing by MPs, and they tend to uh, pursue their own interests. So parties. Uh, are kind of like unions in some way. It, it enforces discipline among the group. So, so I think, yeah, pr proportional representation for this region would be great, and not just for the region, for the province, too. Hi, my name's Kim. I'm a student in the public policy program at SFU. Um, I wanted to ask about something we haven't really talked about today yet, um, but I think it's really salient and important. Given that the federal government has sort of um, express their interest in renewing relationships with First Nations and reconciliation and given that the city of Vancouver has touted itself as the city of reconciliation I'm wondering what the role of regional and municipal governments are in engaging um, and including First Nations in decision-making going forward um, well I can tell you that already we are engaging with the First Nations that are within the jurisdiction uh, um, are board chair, myself, for traveling and meeting with the chiefs and councils around the region. Um, at a local level, Vancouver has met with our three First Nations, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil Waututh, and it's a council to council, and we do that uh, um, annually, uh, but we've recently committed to doing it more often based on issues at, 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 that, they, that arise, and we have memorandums, memorandums of understanding and service agreements that uh, we have with Musqueam, for instance, on you know, provision of water and other services that uh, we have. This is an evolving uh, relationship. There's certainly a continuing understanding that we need to have all of the orders of government at the table, and that, of course, is local government, the provincial, federal, and First Nations. And uh, that's how we uh, will be successful moving forward into the future. Uh, that's Part of the reason why we thought uh, it would be um, positive for us as a city, the first city to declare ourselves the city of reconciliation and, and 
started that process and it was adopt, adopted uh, through other cities and adopted nationally, unanimously at the FCM Board of Directors. This is a 74 member board. Uh, the number, number might be wrong just slightly, but there was a unanimous decision that we need to recognize that uh, there are much more uh, issues to be dealt with. You can't, you can't just uh, leave it to uh, the federal government to, to deal with because uh, there's uh, th these people they live and interact with um, everyone across our, our country, and it's, it's part of our history that needs to be addressed. Yeah, well, I think British Columbia is going to lead the way in this area simply because we don't have treaties. So uh, I think that other provinces will look to British Columbia, to say, uh, British Columbia cities to say, well, how do you manage this new relationship, uh, which I think is a very exciting thing. I think that, uh, you know, we've had some, a couple of the treaties settled in BC, but mostly the land is still, um, you know, it's clouded title. Uh, and so until these relationships start to develop and, um, you know, we're going to continue to have that uncertainty, uh, but I think it's a very positive development. I, you know, every 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 court case that the cre Supreme Court decides that um, first Na it builds First Nations rights uh, to uh, to land means that I think they have more power to to force uh, us to deal with our past, but also to go forward with reconciliation and a new relationship. So how that plays out in cities is critical. Uh, there's a lot of public land in in cities. A lot of that is is open for uh, you know often in in treaties settlements, uh, negotiations anyway, um, and, uh, but we'll lead the way. Uh, so uh, one thing that always strikes me about this relationship is we talk a lot about on-reserve housing, but the one thing we don't talk about is uh, urban Aboriginals, which is half, half the Aboriginal population, Indigenous population in Canada. So my question has always been to the other side is, uh, so how's the money coming along for, uh, you know, urban Aboriginal housing? because it's left to cities uh, and it's a big jump moving, if you've been for generations on a reserve, moving into uh, a densely populated uh, city uh, and if housing isn't available and sometimes, you know, often it should be culturally appropriate. So how does that all work? Uh, the federal government has a role to play and they've been, I would say, negligent on that. So, so I think uh, Vancouver especially, I mean, I think that has, has led the way there and, and a lot of other cities and provinces are looking to BC for, uh, for, for how is this going to move ahead in the rest of the country. Okay, time for one last question. You guys, do you want to flip a coin? <laughs> okay. That's nice. Okay, I just, I, oh, I'm too tall. I want to raise something that um, hasn't really been addressed yet today. I was going to raise two things, but then Kim already spoke about Indigenous rights, which is good. Um, but the other thing that I think is going to be important in terms of the future um, of the region, um, obviously, will be climate change, and I think adapting to climate change. Um, obviously, we should mitigate as much as we can, but we all probably know that there's already effects that we're feeling, particularly as a coastal community. Um, and it seems obvious that regional coordination and working together to have some sort of unified, resilient response would be really useful. Um, so I wonder if any of our, if either panelist has thoughts on how to do that moving forward, and also maybe just food for thought for everyone as well. Thanks. Well, in fact, uh, this term, the board chair and I, we changed the title of our one of our committees to Climate Action, and we have resourced it as a board with the refunded uh, um, gas tax or GST rebates specific to our, our various functions and have a number of different pilot projects that are we are testing in order to, to then show the region, in fact, wider, because we'll share that information with, at the local government level or, or even further than that, on these projects that are meant to deal with uh, climate uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, uh, these are projects that we, we hope to, to have funding at provincial and federal level as well beyond our own seed money that we've put in, put in place. There's no doubt that we need uh, greater action. That uh, uh, and goes, again, back to my uh, comment that we needed to be bold. And you know, when we most our most recent uh, initiative in Vancouver has become 100% renewable energy, and you know that con the, you know I spoke earlier about zero waste, and it, because we mean zero, the intention is to get there. We we might not, but we also don't want to give anybody an excuse that oh we're only moving to 80% zero waste, and then suddenly you say well I'm part of that 20, and you guys take care of that 80%. And I can take the 20. It's the same concept for that 100% renewable energy. 
we need to move in that direction if we're going to deal with uh, climate uh, change. We need to move in that direction so that there's you know, even 1% left on the table. Somebody will say, well, I've got that 1% and uh, you guys take care of that 99%. If it's not renewable, then it's not renewable. And th this is the type of boldness that I'm advocating for. And we're, we're working in that direction at Metro. Uh, we're not all there. But I think it's about uh, uh, steps along the way. Uh, we've had good conversations. Let me put it that way. Hmm. On this issue, I think that uh, I'm extremely proud of what uh, has been accomplished at the municipal level. I think I, I have a, you know, you don't talk to a municipal leader who doesn't have climate change, I I at least in part of their conversation. And I think the city of Vancouver, New West, Burnaby, I think you've all been really leading the way in this issue. And what I think about is there's only one voter. You know, they might vote municipally, provincially, and federally, but there's only one voter, and so all the actions that are taken by the cities are, are really important because they change how regular, you know, how voters think about all their levels. So they think, well, if I, if climate change is important during the municipal election, then of course it's going to carry through the provincial and, and federal. So, so I really think cities have made a huge difference. Uh, probably the biggest difference in the country on this. We're squabbling about, you know, carbon tax versus cap and trade. We still don't have a climate change plan nationally. Uh, any any reduction <coughs> that's come has come from provincial and, and municipal actions. So, so again, I, I do think the, so again, the directly elected mayor or regional district, in that case, I think that uh, there's there's been a great effect with the current structure that we have uh, on the mindsets of voters and it shows in, in the results in cities. Uh, folks that, uh, parties that aren't, don't have this in their uh, in their vocabulary. Aren't tending to win now in, in urban cores, and that's uh, that's again a credit to the to local mayors and councils. And I think, though, uh, we have had some successes. Sure. You know, we we have a, a new federal government that I think we've captured some of their imagination in terms of what can be possible, and they're saying the right things, and I think they're doing some of the right things as well. There's much more work to be done. Uh, it can't be just about those announcements though. And it comes back to what I said earlier about you know, Kennedy and others uh, working hard to hold them account to what they said during that election, making sure that they implement the things they do. When you sign an agreement in Paris and you know, we have all these people uh, watching and talking about what is 167 countries signing this document, that's a big thing. But it, the bigger thing is when we can actually go to implementation. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Louis. Thank you, MP Stewart. So thanks, I think that this panel has been a fantastic and constructive way to, to conclude our activities today. Um,